Cowan is a 35-year veteran in the film industry, having worked on over 40 productions in both features and television. Rob grew up in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, and intend- attended the University of British Columbia Film School. Uh, he's a long-standing member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Directors Guild of America, the Producers Guild of America, and the Writers Guild of America. Cowan began his career in British Columbia as an assistant director on, um, on uh, such money-making films as Three Men and a Baby with Tom Selleck and Ted Danson, Stake Out with Richard Dreyfuss and Emilio Estevez, and Cocktail with Tom Cruise. He transitioned to producing and living in Los Angeles after making two films with Academy Award-winning producer Erwin Winkler. Through that 18-year collaboration, they made films with Robert De Niro, Guilty by Suspicion, and uh, Night and the City, both of which Winkler directed. As head of his own company, Cowan's first project was producing the much-anticipated Righteous Kill, starring Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, followed shortly after by The Conjuring, which was the fourth highest grossing horror film of all time. Next was the new line comedy, Tammy, that teamed Melissa McCarthy with her husband, Ben Falcone, then the blockbuster, San Andreas, starring Dwayne Johnson, which you saw tonight, collaborating again with McCartney and Falcone for Universal's The Boss and continuing his relationship with director James Wan to produce the well-received and box office hit, The Conjuring 2. Um, moderating tonight's discussion is Knife's very own producing instructor, Denise Carlson. Now, will you please help me in giving a warm welcome to our very special guest, Mr. Rob Cowan. Um, so, the first thing I wanted to say, I mean, this movie, I, I loved this movie. It was really a lot of fun. Um, but logistically, the challenges of making a movie like this where you're destroying a whole city must have been enormous. Um, and I'd love it if you would talk a little bit about uh, the logistics of doing some of those scenes. Like we were talking a little bit about sinking the building, for example. Yeah, I mean, you know, as I'm sure you can see, like every, every sort of big sequence that there is in there, even some of the smaller ones, are a big challenge on many levels of, you know, how do you, how do you make some, something look like it's shaking when it may not be shaking because it was so big, some of the sets that we had. And, uh, and we always had to kind of sit down with all the different departments and figure out, okay, well, what's visual effects, what's special effects, what's CGI, what's, what's a real what part of the set that we need to do? How much do we need to give the, the visual effects guys? It, w- it was actually sort of a great thing sometimes because normally when you're doing any movie, you go and if we were doing a street scene, we go, okay, we have to dress this entire street. And a lot of the times the CGI guys would say, if you give us some rubble up the middle of the street, we'll destroy the rest of the building. You go, oh, that's great. So we don't, have to, <laughs> we don't have to be doing that. Go, oh, take two, let's redestroy it again. But some of the sets, I'm sure you can imagine the, the building that was sinking that Alex is in, um, uh, with the guys, with Art and Hugo, um, was our was really our biggest challenge because it was three different floors. Um, we didn't have the time in the movie. We had to obviously kind of redress each floor every time they sank a floor. We would get rid of it and get everybody out and then redo it again, have to take a week or so to redress it and set it for the next floor that's up higher. But just the idea of even trying to figure out, because the set was probably twice the size of this room here, and trying to figure out how to sync that and be able to, I was just saying to Denise, is that, even up to the day we were ready to start really working with the set, the special effects guy said, I don't know if this is going to sink or not. <laughs> I mean, it was a great hydraulic system that he built, but just the idea of whether or not he would be able to sink it on camera and have the water rushing in. Uh, but he did a great job, and it, but it was really kind of, it took everybody involved in the production to t- figure out how the big the set could be and how much we were, water we were able to have in there and how much the w- dump tanks could take. The very first, you know, in the scene when... Uh, Alex gets hit with the water the first time. When we rehearsed that with some stunt doubles the first time, it, the water, we had dump tanks, would blow the back of the set out. So we, oh, we had to re- re- repair the set with about two days left to shoot and then kind of put it back together again. But it was, it, that was sort of the, more, the most fun about the movie was is that we had to take all of these challenges of, of just you know sinking a building. The scene where Carla's running around the restaurant, that was, the director wanted to do that all, <clears throat> excuse me, all in one shot. So from the time she hangs up the phone 
and runs all the way and have, comes all the way around and back up and up the stairs and, and then onto the rooftop. We cut when we got on the rooftop. But he wanted to do it all in one, and so we and we were destroying that. We on that one, we really destroyed the set. So we had one shot at it, and uh, so we obviously rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed, and <laughs> and then took a shot at it. And it was one of those great things where all the work of everybody had done, the props guys and the special effects guys and the stunt people, and all came together and worked really well. And then we decided, well, we'll do it again now that we've done it once. But it was um, it's on these movies, and I'm sure you can imagine that's really the biggest thing is the R and D which unfortunately on this movie we didn't have a lot of time for, but was the R&D of really sitting down and saying, okay, we're going to drop a building on someone or we're going to, you know, we have, we have the, the Golden Gate Bridge, that scene that everybody likes when, it, when the container falls on top of, the, of Daniel. Um, just figuring out, you know, how much, of, how much of Golden Gate Bridge can we build or how much of the Hoover Dam can we build and get away with some CG and how much can we crack. And so it was, um, every one of those scenes would take weeks of discussion drawings and previs, if you know what that means, where they go off and they kind of actually make the movie for you in a, in a sort of uh, like, a, like a video game. Um, but you can see what shots you need and what little bits and pieces you need. So it was, it was very intensive that way. Once we get to, okay, we'd have an idea of how it's all going to work, sometimes the building of it and the shooting of it were less problematic than actually just figuring it out how to do it. So how much <clears throat> time, how much Pre-production time did you have on this movie? It was actually, you know, for a movie like this, it was actually quite short. We had basically, in reality, about 17 weeks. And, You're uh, kidding. Yeah, no, normally, like, um, I'm actually on a bigger movie right now, and we, we're, we're, we have 38 weeks of prep. And it's just, it was a combination of things. One was, uh, which always happens on these movies, is the, the director wasn't fully available because he was finishing a movie that he was on. Uh, Dwayne had to go on to another movie after our movie. So it was kind of like one of those things, if we don't take the window, we would lose the opportunity to get the movie made. And so it was, it was really, it was one of those things we had to sit down with the director and the production designer and the visual effects people and say, okay, this, you know, we either don't make the movie or if we're gonna make it, we're really gonna have to hustle and come up with plans very quickly. And, and the great thing is Brad, the director, Brad Payton, um, he told me, I actually sort of had to have interview him like, can you get this movie made because of this the amount of time we have? And uh, he said, you know, I'll be really decisive. And he, and he was. He was like when we would present him something, he would say yes or no. It wasn't like, well, show me five more and I'll, I'll have a look at it. So that made a big difference. But, uh, but no, it was relatively short um, for the amount of time that we had. And we shot it all mainly in Australia, but we also had stuff in San Francisco and we had stuff in Los Angeles. So scouting time of, of traveling all around to those places it eats up a lot of your prep time as well too. So it just makes it that much more difficult. But it was a good team and everybody I think really pulled together. We had a fantastic visual effects team as I'm sure you see in the movie. I mean, some of the sequences that we did, which was really hard for us and a lot of work, like I said, when, when Carla was running around the building, but when she gets up on the rooftop, we had built like a strip for her to run along. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was so complicated, it was up high, and we had to get giant cranes and wind and throw dust at her. And, and, uh, and then you see it in the movie, and she's this big, you know, running along. Like, all that work we did, and the visual effects guys are blowing up buildings. And so it was a good team that really helped a lot. That's terrific. Um, <clears throat> well, so, and then after 17 weeks of prep, the shoot itself was how long? The shoot was, um, it was about 70 days. Um, uh, with second units built on top mm -hmm. of that. I think we did about, we probably did about 30 days all, all, all broken up because we had to do the helicopter sequence here, the big, you know, the big ending, or sorry, the big original one with the helicopter downtown. That we had to shut down eight city blocks, more PAs than I've ever seen and more police than I've ever seen. I actually wasn't here when they did it. I just saw their time cards. I'm and, sure that uh, didn't make you was happy. In, that was in Australia. <laughs> yeah. um, and... Um, but we had that sequence. We had the, the sequence up on the, up on the mountain at the beginning mm -hmm. with the girl going off the cliff. And then we had the San Francisco sequences and the, hel the parachute sequence. So that was all broken up in a different second units. But our main unit was about 70 days of shooting. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. That's very impressive. Um, uh, one of the scenes that I thought was really interesting mm. to see uh, was the tsunami scene when the tsunami came in. Right, right. Part of... Part of it was the logistics of shooting that tsunami scene, but I don't know if you guys noticed this, but the, the way they used sound and music um, to really change the tone 
um, which I thought was was kind of fascinating. Yeah, it's one of those things, you know, that point, you know, in the movie and some of the other sequences as well. And it's and it's it's one of the more fun things about post is when you get music and sound effects working together. And sometimes you don't you're not sure, particularly in the Conjuring movies, they do. Sometimes we'll be on the mixing stage. They go, okay, who's that? Is that sound effects or is that music? Because they've <laughs> kind of blended together and they're working off each other. But but and they really do have to work together because, as you said, the idea of dropping the sound out and letting just the music play and it kind of heightens the anticipation of what's going to happen. Um, and those are all choices that are made by the director and some, you know, the other and suggestions made by editors and everyone else. But it was really, I know, a choice of, of uh, Brad's for some of those sequences. You know, like when Carla falls off of the building and then he wanted to just go to dead quiet and be in her head about what was happening, not continue all the craziness that was going on. So if you notice at that moment, all the sound dropped out and you just hear a buzz. So you're in Carla's head for quite a while until all of a sudden she gets woken out of it and knows what's going on. So it is sort of the fun of post of coming up with those ideas and seeing how they play and can you get away with very little sound and just a little bit of music and or sometimes no music at all and just let the sound play off of it and let the let that drive the scene. Yeah, it's great because you it <clears throat> it really affects the audience, I think, in ways that they may not even understand. You know, right, right, yeah. They may yeah. not realize. Hopefully by that point you're caught up in the yeah. movie and you're <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and, and another thing that I, um, I really liked about the film is that it had more of a story, more of uh, mm -hmm. a little more heart than a lot of movies like these do. It right. had, uh, and I know you have a bit of a background as a writer, and I'm wondering if that impacts those kinds of choices and that kind of development. Well, it, you know, as I was saying earlier on, I was telling Denise is that the interesting thing about this movie is that at one point it was. Uh, an action disaster movie, and 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 there. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of these Irwin Allen movies, but back in the '60s, probably '70s, there was a guy, and that's all he did was disaster movies. He did a movie called Earthquake and a mm -hmm. movie called Towering Inferno, and and what he would do in those movies is he would put like about 20 different storylines, and and in some of those movies they would get all the top stars of the day. They'd have Paul Newman and and Jimmy Stewart and all these great great actors, and they would all have their own storyline. So the original script of this was built that way. It had about six different storylines and trying to follow everybody. And there's kind of a little bit of remnants, like the uh, the reporter that Archie Punjabi plays, that she had her own little bit of a storyline, and Paul Giamatti had a bit more of a storyline. But we realized, you know, A, it's a it's a casting nightmare these days to try and say we're going to get all these guys. Um, you look like Fast 7 now, the Fast <laughs> movies, trying to get all those guys together. Oh, God. Um, but it was also the idea of, like, trying to give it more heart. And the idea to focus on Dwayne's character before he was on board, but the idea of that character and just kind of narrowing it down. And um, and at that point, writers were brought on. Actually, the guys who had been writing the Conjuring movies, Chad and Carrie Hayes, were really great writers. And they came in with the idea of the little girl dying, um, Mallory, and um, and really kind of building a heart to the drive of the character and what they're after and what they're, you know, that isn't just, oh, we obviously got to save our daughter, but there's a more emotional in the divorce and um, and I thought what they did really well, as I was saying earlier, is that they layered in that story as opposed to starting the movie up with somebody saying, oh, her, the daughter died and died like this. And so the notion of trying to use the action of the movie and the dynamics of the movie as they went along, as Carla and Dwayne were trying to go and rescue Alex, is that they were, we learned more about what had happened as it went along and we learned more about why the divorce had happened. And so... The story and the plot and the action of the story helped drive that character emotion, and so it was, I think it made it. I think that's why it feels more emotional because it was more interwoven. All the character drive was interwoven into what they were doing, as opposed to exposition that's just laid out for you. Yeah. It's so it, so by I think getting rid of all that other storylines and just kind of having touch of it, and we even trimmed some stuff back. I think it made it more emotional and and, and more fun. Like I say, when you when you see Alex kissing Hugo and when you see, you know, the, the, the dad, Daniel getting, you're much more invested in those storylines at that point because it was much cleaner. And we didn't want to try and make it over-involved because there's enough going on with destroying the city. Yes, and you destroyed yeah, a lot destroyed of the city. It. But, I mean, people were applauding when, uh, you know, when they kissed finally. You know, yeah. it was lovely. Um, and it really was a satisfying moment as opposed to just being, oh, okay, now the characters are kissing. Okay, yeah. yeah. It was it was really it felt satisfying and and like we were oh, invested good. in them. Oh, that's good. Good. So yeah. 
Um, and a little art breaking them up, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you want them to get back together, don't you? <laughs> he's, and he's got a movie coming out, Kubo, Kubo, right? Oh, the little yeah. animated thing. Art plays the lead character in that. Oh, he it, does? It's an animated thing, but he's the lead character in it, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's supposed actor. to actually be a wonderful movie. Yeah, no, I've heard. I've, I've heard, yeah. 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 I've heard it's great. Um, well, so, you, I mean, in this, you were destroying a lot of stuff. Um, it's like they faced not just one building going down, not just two, like every, it's like they couldn't catch a break. No. Um, <laughs> and it was tricky, too, with the stuff downtown, you know, when cars running around the rooftop, because... You kind of have to tell buildings that were destroyed, like they were going were to drop them, and particularly the one that she was in, because we were featuring it so heavily. Um, it was tricky with them because we they did not want to have the idea that their building could be destroyed. It was same with the thing with AT and T Park, is they didn't want the idea. They wanted to feel like if there was a disaster like this, like um, with Katrina, that mm-hmm. they would be the Superdome, that everyone would come and they'd have somewhere that they could go and be safe and be able to get medical supplies. And so it was a little tricky because we needed to make it dangerous enough, but kind of walk that fine line with showing, we had, we probably went through five phases of sending them photos and videos to say, this is, and they go, can you not make that part fall down so much? And so we back off of it a little bit. And it was the same thing with the building that Carla was in. We had to negotiate with them about how much we would destroy. destroy and, and although I think it drops at the end of the movie, it, I mean, at the end of the scene, but. Um, but yeah, it was a very big negotiation with all those buildings about how much we were able to do with them. Was it a little bit easier <clears throat> because you said all the the other buildings around them around were them, also yeah, going to exactly. be destroyed yeah, too? Yeah, yeah. 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 So it's not like it's you're not the just only you one. one. Yeah. Um. <laughs> it's like the Trans America building. You know, that was a the, the what you know the pointed building in San Francisco. That was a big thing. They did not want to. They're oh, sure. they're because they're an insurance company, right? So they don't want to be. <laughs> They don't want to be like, oh, yeah, our building goes down, but we're a good insurance company. We'll look out you. But it's okay because we're insured. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, you've done a lot of different kinds of movies in your career. Uh-huh. Um, you you <clears throat> also, you've worked on a lot of big movies like this, but you've also done some smaller movies. You were talking earlier about The Conjuring. Right. Um, which was, you know, I, I don't know if you guys have all seen it, but it's a wonderful movie. Um, but done for a lot less money and a lot more intimate and a lot more uh, sort of a more personal story. Right, in a lot right, of ways. yeah. Um, how is that different uh, when, you're, when you're making a movie like that as opposed to making something? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, the interesting thing is, um, you know, as we said that we did, um, we did, you know, really work on the characters of San Andreas and tried to keep it, you know, simple, but it pulled a lot of heart. And, you know, a lot of it's in the performances of the actors, too, because I think we got really good actors. Um, but, you know, and so, but as I was saying earlier, what then takes over the movie is just physically how you're going to do it. And and the tricky thing with these movies is you're rarely, um, I was just talking with our production designer on the movie I'm right now, which is the same thing is you're rarely shooting a scene. You know, it's what you guys are doing or will do this week is where you get two actors in a room and go, okay, you know, let's talk and do and we'll move the camera a little bit. You're rarely doing a scene. You're mainly doing pieces, right? You know, you you have all these uh, storyboards and pieces from the previous that you put up on the wall and on a day you show up and there's a board and you go, we need to get that piece. Like if, if you know, all the stuff of Dwayne and Carla driving around on the boat was done dry on a gimbal and so it's it's tricky of knowing like where are they like what you know so we would have a photo and we'd realize or a little bit of a video and we'd have to explain to Carla and, and Dwayne you know you're you're driving through you know this and you're going to see a big giant plane that's crashed above you and and we're going to move the camera past you but in reality you're driving past the camera and so it's a little complicated and so it's a little technical um, and uh because every and even some scenes are like today we're shooting like the girl on the cliff, mm-hmm. you know some of that was on the real location, some of it was from a helicopter, and some of it was was from um, Australia where we built we built a wall of the set and hung a car off of it. So you're intermingling a bunch of shots, and so you're literally getting these pieces and making it very so it's very technical. Um, and the good thing with Brad though was he still was able to, to work and get those performances out because, of, you know, to add the heart in the movie. When we're doing a movie like The Conjuring, there's still a lot of technicalities to it because we have a lot of ghost stuff that's going on. But in reality, that that you really get to spend a lot of time on on the characters and on the interrelationships. And 
and the director, James Wan, who did both The Conjurings, um, is really good at that and really good at moving the camera to help tell the story that he wants to tell with the characters. Mm -hmm. um, we were doing, we were mainly on, on the San Andreas, moving the camera and doing things with the camera to enhance the action and the drama and the sort of scares of it all. So it's a slightly different kind of approach on your day to day. Um, but every movie has its hurdles. I mean, every movie, um, every movie is up against it with money. As much money as we had on, on San Andreas, we still, every day, your conversation is how do we do it for cheaper and how do we come up with a different way? And uh, there's a story, actually, it's a, it's a story that I, I as, as um, Robert said, I used to work with a producer, Erwin Winkler, who did the Rocky movies and <laughs> Raging Bulls and all that. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Rocky movies. There's the one that came out recently, Creed. But he told the story, which I think is a great story about money, is that he, um, <clears throat> and it's good for what you guys are doing in your little shoots, is that um, if you ever saw the original Rocky movie, there's a, he's courting Talia Shire, and uh, he takes her out skating because she wants to go skating, and it's Thanksgiving. And they had no money to make the movie. It was made for a million dollars. And they were, um, so there was a scene that Sly Stallone had written where they go they go because it's Thanksgiving and everybody's out and everybody's skating and there's all these extras and people are eating hot dogs and all this kind of thing. And they realized they had no money. They couldn't pay the extras. They couldn't do wardrobe the extras. They couldn't get skates for the extras. They, you know, they didn't want all the food and everything else and catering for the extras and all that kind of thing. And so they went to Sly and they said, yeah, look, we can't. And so he said, oh, I got an idea. Why don't we change the scene and I'll pay uh, the guy at the door to let us, to let us in because it's closed and I won't skate and Talia will skate and I'll just walk along with her and it'll be just Talia and I just walking along with her. And it's probably one of the best scenes in the movie that came about because they had no money. And so it's one of those things, you know, when we're up and when we're shooting these movies and everybody feels like there's always that time when everybody's like, we got to spend more, we got to do bigger, we got to have 10, you know, if there's five, let's have 10. And if there's, but, you know, I always feel that story has a lot of value because you realize there are different ways and better ways to do things when you're challenged. James Wan, the director on The Conjuring, is great at that. You know, if they come up and say, look, we got to find a different way to do it, he kind of energizes them and, kind of, and he always comes up with something better. So it's not, a, you can't just tell him he has no money all the time, but, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, or, he had, catch, or, he not, ca or he catches especially on. Especially not and, now. Yeah, <laughs> no, not now, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, um, but it, you know, but it is true. You know, there's all, there is different ways to do it. And so, because like I said, you know, one of your biggest challenges on movies are always time and money. And, and, you know, all the hurdles that we went through with trying to sink that, that bu building was really just, we, we didn't have a lot of time to figure it out. And on the first Conjuring, we had very little money to do anything, and and we put sunk it all into the set because that house was a set, and um, and it was really something we weren't sure we were going to be able to pull off, and because we we just didn't have a lot of money, and so we that we thought James and I got together and just thought, okay, that'll be that's our that's a character in the movie, and we'll invest in that. That's where we're going to put all of our investment for the movie, and and he'll take care of everything else after that. We're not going to have any fancy tricks. We did most of the the gags in camera. We did, we did very little CGI in the movie, and so he just said, I, I can do all the rest of it if you just give me a, a really good house to shoot in. Well, and it really worked because, <clears throat> I mean, the perf I think it's so performance-based. Right, And it was yeah. so well cast. Have you guys all seen The Conjuring? It's so well yeah, cast. Yeah, Patrick and Vera and, and, and Lily. It was great. Yeah. Lily was amazing. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, made it. So, I mean, it was just like uh, you couldn't turn away from that movie. Oh, good. <laughs> you really couldn't turn away unless from Unless you're that like movie. this, right? Well, yeah. yes. <laughs> unless, you can, <laughs> unless you're hiding. Yeah. Um, you, but, you know, it's interesting because you've also done a lot of different kinds of movies. Like you've done comedies. You've done Tammy. You did The Boss. You've done, mm. um, you've even done some TV movies yeah. and things from way back. But yeah. um, what draws you to a project? You know, it, it's the, probably the easiest way to say it is that you spend a lot of time on, on these movies. And even if it's a small movie, you know, it's still a number of months. Um, you know, a movie like San Andreas is, is over a year. And, and, uh, and even The Conjuring was, you know, nine months, almost a year. And, and with posts and everything, it becomes a year. And so you can't, you can't do something you don't believe in. You can't, you know, you, you want to make a movie that ideally you think somebody's going to want to see. And... Uh, so you really feel like you know you have to find something that you're passionate about and that you really believe in, either the people that are involved in it, um, like the Melissa McCarthy movies I work with. They're they're great storylines, um, but I really believe in those guys, Melissa and her husband Ben, 
and um, and they're great people to work with, and you want to just have a, a nice experience because it's hard work, and uh, you know you're away from your family at times, and so you really find you know I, at, at the heart of it, the first thing I'll do is read the script, and um, and you obviously want to know who the players are that are involved and everything like that, but. But if you, I've, I've turned down a lot of movies because I've read the script and I think I just can't see myself standing on the set every day trying to make this movie, whatever yeah. it is. You know, and sometimes they've turned out really well. I mean, it's not like they're good or bad movies, but if you can't imagine yourself doing it, then it's, uh, then it's hard. And I also sort of feel like I want to try and feel like I'm doing not necessarily something different, but not repeating what I've done in the past before and trying to do... When I was with Irwin, we were there, I was there 20 years or so, and we made about 15, 16 movies. And we were always trying to change it up and trying to do something that was a different storyline or a different world to explore or different character to explore. Um, we did a musical. We did, uh, you know, the Life is Us that they were saying, which is a very personal story. We did thrillers. And, and, uh, and since I've been on my own, it's the same thing. You know, it's finding something that really feels like it's a challenge and something you can imagine yourself standing on the set every day. That's great. Um, one other thing, uh, um, I do find that it's kind of, uh, it's, it's always an interesting uh, thing that, you know, you're working with, like you just, you worked with The Rock on this movie, and he's, a, he's rumored to be a very lovely person to work with and very hardworking. Sometimes you're not working with someone who is quite so charming. How do you handle that? Because that's one of the things that a producer might have to deal with. Um, you know, I've actually, I have to say I've actually been pretty lucky. Oh, well. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's one of those things that you, um, there are, you know, there's personalities, definitely. Um, and I think, and again, I think it goes to this, exactly what I was just saying about myself. I think if, I think when you hear that people are acting up, like Dwayne's a good example of what he was writing about recently, but I think it's like they're, the people that, they're not happy being there. They're either, they're, take, they're doing the movie because they're getting paid a lot of money, um, or, you know, they've been forced into it for whatever reason or they don't buy the director or whatever it might be. And, um, and I think they're just unhappy being there. And, and, and I feel like I've been lucky enough that we've been able to put together teams of people. And it's not, it's not always the actors either. You know, you no. can have difficulties with, you know, other members, you know, production designers or, you know, uh, cameramen or whatever. But I think it's, it's a, you know, about casting well, like casting the, the players, everybody who's going to make the movie together, the actors. And... Um, and putting them in an environment that is healthy, that they feel good about, that they feel like they're making something that's good and worthwhile and fun and that there's a good group of people around. And, and you know, and as I've gone on in my career, I've, I've been able to have a bit of luxury of being able to work with people like James, who's, who I'm doing a movie with right now, um, who's fantastic and good to people and wants to have fun and wants everybody else to have fun making the movie. And obviously Melissa, who's just the sweetest person on the earth and obviously is funny and wants to have fun. Um, but it, but I think it's also just about building environments that people are excited about what they're doing and that they're, they feel like they're making something good and they're being listened to, um, on whoever it is, whether it's the PA or whether it's the star of the movie, that they really feel like that, that they're all part of the family of making the movie. And so, you know, I, I, have, I have to say I've never run into, you know, where, you know, you want to take somebody out and, <laughs> into the woodshed. Um, but um, the, uh, uh, and I've worked with difficult actors. Um, but they've been great. Uh, the picture I did with Al Pacino and, and, and De Niro, and they were just great. I've done three movies with, with De Niro, but, but Al has a reputation, and, uh, and he was great. He couldn't have been better. You know, he understood the circumstances that we were making the movie under, which was not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and for somebody who is, is really loves the art of acting and really loves the art of rehearsing, uh, which we didn't have any time for, he kind of really went with it and understood, you know, the movie he was making and, you know, liked the environment, liked working with Bob and uh, De Niro. Um, and uh, so I think it's about building a good environment for everybody. That's very good advice. Okay. Okay, so it, do any of you guys have any questions that you want to ask? We have a microphone right there. Um, what is your advice for anyone who's wanting to start in the industry of filmmaking, uh, kind of like us, being young and going into college, what is your advice? Uh, you know, I think it's, you know, and you guys may know this, it, it is a hard industry, it's, and, and, but it's also, I was saying to this somebody the other day, is that, you know, it's, it's an industry that you sit and you look at a closed door 
no matter what level you are in the industry, you know, to you, you know, where, whether it's me or five years ago or 10 years ago or anybody, we, and we all say this, everybody who's working in the industry, is that you always feel like there's levels of closed doors in front of you. And I always feel like the, the interesting thing is, is that if, there, if you know, there's a crack in the door and you get your foot in there and then you get through that door and when you turn around, that door is, is always wide open. Like it's one of those things, it's not like that you realize that if once you're in there, it's, um, it's not as mysterious as you think it might be. But I really think that it is a tough, it is a tough business. Um, I, it comes down to just hard work. You know, it's really um, loving what you do and I think you really have to love what you do. Um, because it is, um, it's long hours at times. If you're on the set, it's, um, it's a lot of rejection at times. Um, you know, if you're a writer, you're constantly rewriting and thinking you've done the best you could ever do and then you have to do more. Um, it's, you know, it's, if you're directing, it's trying to get that first gig or trying to create something that's that first gig. Um, but I think it's just really knowing, knowing as much as you can about the business, no matter what you're doing. If you're a writer, um, if you're, you know, a director or you want to go into production, you want to be uh, in development or you want to be a PA, it's really understanding as much as you can about the business. Like learn everything you can. Learn about who the studio execs are. Learn about who the writers are. Learn about who is won Sundance this year. Watch as many movies as you can. And not just, you know, San Andreas and The Conjuring or uh, Suicide Squad. You know, go back and watch. There's some great movies that will really surprise you from from back aways. You know, the, the Hitchcock movies and John Ford movies and... Scorsese has a list out right now. I think it's the 50 great movies. If you watch, read them and, and pick 10 of them and just watch them. And so really try and become versed. The people that I know that are in the business, they really know the world of the movies. You can throw names out. You can talk about people that made movies 40 years ago and you can talk about movies that people that just made a movie and they know that. Um, and, um, but really try and also hone, you know, what you're doing, you know, hone the, what a particular craft that you're in and really, you know, work hard on it. Um, the great thing though is, for you guys right now is, it's probably no better time than to be in the movie business or to be in you know the, this side of the entertainment business wherever it takes you, whether it's, it's not just the movie business, the TV business or it's the VR business or whatever you know, comes with all this stuff that you guys are learning. Um, you know, when I started out, we, we shot on Super 8 that we had to cut when they, you know, and tape together and, and then had nowhere to show it. And, you know, you guys have got YouTube and you've got Netflix that are, you know, making movies and Amazon and Hulu and, and a big world of VR going on right now. And uh, there's so many avenues and you can also, and I've done it with a friend of mine, you can take the, you know, the camera that you can buy in a store and make a feature film out of it. You can, uh, there's a guy that um, he's directing the Annabelle 2 right now who directed Lights Out, which is a spinoff of, not Lights Out, but Annabelle 2 is a spinoff of The Conjuring. And he made a five-minute short, you know, in his house with his wife as the lead. And somebody saw it and said, you know, and that's, there's nothing magical about that. It wasn't like, well, that guy, he knew, you know, he knew Steven Spielberg and Steven Spielberg. But he found it and he got it out into a festival and he got it out there and somebody saw it and said, this is really cool. And it wasn't the first one he did either. It wasn't like, oh, well, you know, he did a couple of them and somebody saw it. And now he's directing, uh, he directed a $5 million Lights Out, which has done really well. He's directing... Annabelle 2, which is a much bigger budget. Um, and he'll, he potentially might go on to direct one of the bigger other pieces of our franchise of The Conjuring. And so, but it's a great, I'd, like I said, I mean, you guys have got so many great tools at your disposal that you can do in your basement or you can, you know, get the, the, uh, the, the um, visual effects, uh, you know, apps that you can make stuff with. And so it's, um, it's a really good time for you guys right now and you really should take advantage of it. But I, I think it's really just be really passionate about it, work really hard at what you're doing, keep trying to learning, and also do the, you know, network with all your friends and find more people to network. I find that I've gotten more jobs or more connections on jobs or gotten called about something because of people I knew or people who knew people who I knew. And so, and try and get out in the mm -hmm. community. Even if you're going back to London or wherever you guys are from, there are those communities there. And uh, find ways to get involved in them, find ways to get involved in acting communities or writers or, it's, you know, it's such a, a rich environment and such a rich world to play in. Um, and it's, there really are big doors open for all you guys. And, and also the, everybody in this room will either be running a studio in 10 years from now or, you know, someone's got to fill these slots. It, mm -hmm. isn't, it isn't a closed door that way. Guys that I know that when I started that were, 
creative executives of the studio are now the head of the studio. And so, or guys I knew are now directing, you know, major, a, a buddy of mine that we started out together is now one of the biggest television directors there is and doing lots of pilots and has done features. And so, so it's all possible. It's really just putting your mind to it and really working hard at it. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, um, the minor amount of damage that the characters received while <laughs> in these um, events was quite surprising. So tell me, how long did you take to, say, look over the movie's logical flaws? Well, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, there's a lot bigger logical flaws than that. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of those tricky things, you know, because you, and, and, it, and to be honest, everybody is aware of that when you're doing it. And um, some, of it, some of you have to deal with continuity, right? And so, like, say with, with Dwayne, if, if we put a big scar on his face, right, because he got damaged in, you know, the helicopter crash or whatever it might be, you might, you might at one point realize we need to move the helicopter crash later, and now he's, but he's got a big scar on the side of his face and we can't have him have the big scar on his face later on. So you try and keep, you know, we tried to muddy them up as much as we could. Um, same thing with Alex, we tried to do as much as we could with them, but there is certain levels of that you have to, and it's not just continuity of, of when you're shooting it, you know, and there is that day to day of trying to, okay, well, we, we, we're gonna do a scene right now where he's gotta have that scar off, so he's gotta go away for two hours of prosthetic makeup to get it off, but we're gonna do another scene and, and it's just, you know, slowing the day down. But it's also, like I say, you, you might edit a scene out and now there's an inexplicable scar on the side of his face so you have to come up with a reason why it's there. So we tried to, you'll see that in most movies, we tried to temper it down as much as we could. I mean, obviously, uh, Hugo had that thing in his leg, but that was a very specific, right from that moment that that happened, we went right into the build. We knew we were doing that. We wouldn't have wanted to do it earlier on at the beginning of the movie because same reason, what if we cut that scene or what if we leapfrog the scene around and now he's he's got this limp and we have to worry about a limp that he's got. So it was a little bit of it was with that of just trying to sort of manage the day to day shooting and also manage when we're cutting the movie that we don't run into a trouble with something that's out of whack because the nice thing about this movie was they 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 barely I mean Alex never changed and Hugo never changed. Uh, they lost ties and things like that. But so we wanted to be able to keep it simple and be able to move very quickly with the filming that we had to do. So you also want, you know, you've got movie stars, right? And you want them to sort of maintain their movie star look as they go through it. So it's, you know, it is a fine line and it's, you know, it's a good point, but it's a fine line that you have to walk. Because like I say, there could have been bigger issues that we would have had if we had sort of added more damage to them. So it's kind of like, you know, sort of going with that there's a certain, you know, suspension of disbelief. You know, I, you know for me, a, a bigger issue is he took off with a helicopter to go arrest his daughter while, you know, Hollywood was still like collapsing around him. And so you want the audience to just feel like they're empowered and they're running with the characters and they want to see what they're doing next. And, you know, in some way not worrying too much about, you know, what they were doing with the damage that had happened to them. All right, thank you. Okay. <laughs> It's the rock after all. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't get it. Really? really. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Um, so for like filming The Conjuring, you were doing it in like a bar, probably in the dark most of the time. Yes. And it was definitely a dark movie. Yeah. Did you guys experience anything like <laughs> dark while you were you mean filming mean something it? happening? Um, yeah. You know, I couldn't say that there was anything specific, but, you know, the, particularly the first Conjuring, uh, the um, the uh, artifact room, if you remember when they go in the artifact room and there's the, there was a couple scenes we did early on and then there's a scene at the end. Um, we shot that towards the end of the movie and there were there were crew members that would not go in there. And um, and there, there, I know there was a uh, camera assistant who, I don't know if you, you may not remember, but there's a lion, there's a, like a wooden lion, an Asian lion that's in there. And uh, a camera assistant went in and to pick up one of the, cam the camera boxes that had been left inside there and swears that he turned around and that the lion went from one side of the room to the other side of the room. And so that really stopped people from going inside <laughs> the artifact room. We had very few people going there. And the, um, but we never, I couldn't be, I mean, there was a lot of like, people would say when they went home at night, things were happening to them um, and, you know, doors closing and things like that. But uh, I couldn't say there was like one particular big haunting, yeah. but we, uh, 
I know we we did some pickup shots when the movie was when the movie was over, and we needed to go, go to get some inserts. And one of them was with the Annabelle doll, and so it's it was being held somewhere uh, special. And um, <laughs> so I asked it to have it sent to the office. And the minute it arrived, I got a call from the office saying, "You have to come and get this thing out of here. We're not <laughs> we're not allowing this thing to sit in in our uh, in our office." So I had to go and get it out of there. But uh, but we then on the Conjuring two. Um, we actually brought an exorcist in at the beginning of the movie and had them bless the set just to just yeah. to make sure that nothing, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> nothing bad happened. Yeah. <clears throat> so we were lucky; nothing bad happened on it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. What a good question. <laughs> Hello. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, my name is Dustin Ardine. I'm in the acting program here. And I was wondering, as actors, one of the, the roads we have to go down to kind of break in the door of Hollywood is producing our own content, uh, filming our own stuff, as you mentioned earlier, maybe yeah. trying to get it into film festivals or pitch it to a pro, uh, you know, studio of producers. And I was wondering if you could uh, had any ideas of, of better ways or good, good examples of how we can do that. Um, well, you know, I think you're right. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, you know, again, as I was saying earlier on, you've got m a great amount of you know avenues to be able to try and do something in short film festivals, and and I think the more obviously the more you act, the more you know you're you're going to get better at it, and also the more material you have for people to look at. Um, I don't think there's any real magic bullet in that. Um, the the nice thing in a way now is, and and I know it's not open calls, but compared to what it used to be like for casting. We used to, when we were doing casting, we would, you know, we would say, look, we need to cast Alex's character, right? And so they would set up, the casting people might call in 30 people, and out of those 30 people, they would uh, choose five. And the director and I would go in and sit on a very specific session, watch five people come in and read them and, you know, do that. Um, and some people still do that. You know, Melissa McCarthy will do that with certain roles in the movie and that. But a lot of directors don't. A lot of directors do, do not go to casting sessions anymore. And you think, well, that's a bad thing. But actually, in reality, what happens is we're now looking at a lot of, of uh, footage that's being sent in from the homes. People are self-taping themselves. As a matter of fact, Lily Taylor, who has her career in her own right, self-taped herself for The Conjuring. And it was literally on a cell phone. And it literally you know, it was like stood like that. You know, it wasn't even like frame prop. It was standing up like this. I, I'm not even sure she held it herself. But, um, and she filmed it and sent it to us and we cast her off of that. So there's sort of, your, I think you have a, a little bit more access to get into casting people now than it used to be because they would go to their people and their agents and ask for, you know, you know and there would be like this sort of a closed thing. I know that we've done some open calls, you know, where they've said send in and there's a link you can send it to and you send the link in and they'll watch, you know, these things and, and pe people break out because of that. But I think, you know, what you were saying is if you've got buddies that you can make a, a film together and find something that shows you off, you know, and as best you can, whether it's, you know, Billy Bob Thornton doing Sling Blade um, or, uh, or, or so you're a secondary character, I think it's, you know, good to just have material to be able to show people. And, uh, and it's just, you know, it's like I was saying early on, it's just keeping at it. You know, it, I always feel like it, it breaks somewhere along the line. It, and, um, and if you hang in there with it, and particularly acting, I think is obviously one of the hardest things, but I think if you hang in there with it, somewhere along the line, it'll, it'll break for you and you'll find you know, that role that'll mean something and be able to put you into a different, into a different category. And, but it's just, it's just you know, keep, keep the volume coming and, uh, uh, and keep acting, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, My name is Yogo. I'm from the producing course. Um, I just want to ask about your transition from AD to producer. When you thought it would be a good time for it, does it make you a better producer? Being, having experience as AD. Um, you know, answer your second part first. I actually do feel it does. You know that that. Uh, I mean, I I just to give you a real quick history is that I actually started as a PA in in commercials and and. And felt, and I learned a lot in those because, I, and same thing if you do short, you know, small movies or short movies, or whatever. Because, because I did everything. You know, I would I would hang out with the camera guys, and I would get lenses, or sometimes I would be pulling focus for shots, or you know, in these commercials or whatever. And sometimes I'd be helping out in craft service, or I might be helping out in set decorating. Um, but as an AD, um, 
I feel like you know you run the gamut of experience because you're um, you're you know working with the production manager, working with the elements of like budgetarily questions that things need people need to find out, and as you rise up from third AD to second AD to you know your second AD, you're working with the actors a lot more and you're working closer, a little bit closer with the director to win your first AD. And, and I probably did 10 movies as a first, and you're right there with the director, hearing all those conversations that go on and, and with the producer and their decisions. And, and I think it's really beneficial as a producer. Um, and even if, you know, the, as you know, there's varying different kinds of producers. There's producers that um, just develop and get a project going and, and uh, uh, have relationships with studios and, and then they, you know, move on and get another development project to move on and, and, the, and the actual making of the movie is less interesting to them and, you know, uh, finishing it will be, but less making of it. And then there's people that just do the line producing, which is, you know, which is great to come up out of, line, you know, ADs and UPM and all that kind of thing. But even I went into to development as, as a producer, uh, as a, out of coming out of being a first AD, and as an AD, it was really helpful. It was really helpful to know how the set worked and what the parameters were and what goes on on the set and what, you know, actors want when, you know, on a day, you know, you can fantasize all you want, what's going to really happen. But when you get there on the day and that actor shows up and he wants to go out the door and he should <laughs> stay by the window. And and uh, and it's good to know those things. And, and, and also, one of the things when I was working with Irwin that we both learned quite a bit about was you know, you, you the actors want something to show off. Like they, I don't mean that in a bad way, but you know, you can have a great character, but if there's nothing, if there's not that scene, if there's not something that makes them say, "I can't wait to do that moment," I mean, we had it with Paul Giamatti. That role was not much of a role, and um, and he really turned it into something. And and part of it for him was that scene when he sits there and says, you know, looks right at the camera and mm -hmm. says, you know, God help, you know, San Francisco. And I know that was the scene he really wanted to play, and so. Uh, but anyways, going back to your question is that um, uh, it did help a lot to 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 be a, uh, an AD and also because I knew a lot about all the nuts and bolts of making a movie. Um, and now I've forgotten your first question. You were um, asking about producing. Yeah. Well, when was the time that he fought you? Oh yeah. It you know it, mine came out. Mine came about uh, by circumstance. It was it was not a planned. I was not sitting there one day saying, okay, I'm going to do five movies as a first AD and then I'll do this. Um, it was um, it was somewhat accidental. I'd actually been working on um, a bunch of movies for Disney, and I and I and then I did a movie with this producer Owen Winkler, and um, uh, and one of the producers on one of the Disney movies said to me, gave me a piece of advice. He said, "Look, next time somebody comes along and wants to hire you again, meaning you have a bit of cachet with it, he said you should say to them, look, I would I'd like to." Um, I'd like to learn more and I'd like to produce. So basically he said to sort of take that as an opportunity to kind of, you know, take a step up. So it was funny because when he had said that to me, literally Irwin, who I had just worked with, called and said, oh, I've got this other movie. So I went in and I <laughs> said to him, I want to do more. I repeated back what this producer had said to me. And he said, great. He said, I, you know, at the time he said, I can't pay you for now, but, um, but by all means, come on. And... Um, and I never left. I was there for I was there for 18 years after that because we started a movie. It fell apart. Irwin said, "Why don't you come back and we'll start on another movie?" And we started development, and then we just kept going. And so, um, but I mean, if it if you know outside of that, if there were sort of a transitionary phase, you know, because you can also get to a point where it's comfortable. It's you know, and I think you kind of have to step out of your comfort zone every once in a while, and you may. You know, be an AD or a unit production manager somewhere else, and you may be just saying, "Okay, oh, but I'll do one more of these." You know, and so it just sort of, for me, it was sort of stepping out of going, "Okay, I'm going to step away from being an AD and I'm going to go into producing and see how that, see how that works." And you know, I had the luxury that it was with it was with a company. But are you are you where are you right now? Are you just starting in the class? And uh, I have experience as a BA and as a second second, uh -huh. uh, but and I would love to move up. Yeah, and as a way to grow and to be a producer. Well, I think it's definitely good to try and keep on that path, you know, and also learn as much as you can about budgeting and scheduling, which you'll get in, as being an AD, but budgeting, which you don't get so much as an AD. And I think it's worth keeping the learning here. Yes, um, you do. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I should send some people to that class. Uh, <laughs> is, um, is that uh, I think you know keep on that path. It's a good path, you know, and 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 I think sort of. Because a lot of people will go off to be UPMs and sort of stay in that place as well too. But and also find opportunities. You know, it's always like somebody's got a small movie that they need help on, 
And uh, you could go in and say, look, I've got enough experience to kind of help you with this as a producer, uh, even though it may not be sort of a bigger movie, but just kind of getting things underneath your belt. And, and again, like going back to what, everything I said earlier on is that the more you, you know, work with people and help people and, you know, and work on different sizes of productions, um, uh, the more you're going to learn, the more networking you're going to be, the more valuable you become. That's sort of the one of the, the last thing I'll say to you guys is that, is that finding a way to make yourself valuable. And it was one of the things I would try and do when I was even starting out as a third AD in Canada, they called them third ADs, was I tried to learn everything I could about the contracts. And I thought, I should just do that because mm -hmm. that's what you should do. And then I discovered nobody did it. And so all of a sudden people were calling me for contract advice because I knew all <laughs> this, right? And, and so, and I think if you just find you know, ways to make yourself, particularly as you're moving up like you are, find a way to make yourself valuable, find a way to find out something more than anybody else knows about or really be able to be somebody that people can count on and call on uh, because it's, it is, you'll be surprised how many people will move up and really not have all the tools that they, that they have at their disposal um, or that they should have at their disposal and really make themselves kind of a well-rounded filmmaker. Thank you so much. Well, I think that's it for now. Um, thank you so much, Rob. This has been wonderful. Um, well, thank you. Thanks for everybody coming. Yeah. yeah. Let's give Rob a round of applause for being here.